Welcome to the School of Information. I'm Anno Saxeni and I'm the Dean here. It's great to see so many both familiar and new faces in the room. Um, we have a special speaker today, uh, Jack Cochran, uh, who's going to speak about transforming healthcare in the information age, very relevant topic for all of us. Um, Dr. Cochran is the executive director of the Permanente Foundation. The Permanente Foundation uh, represents the national interests of the regional Permanente medical groups, which employ 16,000 physicians caring for 9 million Kaiser Permanente members, myself included, a very happy, <laughs> a happy camper. Um, prior to coming to the Federation, um, Jack served as an executive med medical director and president and chairman of the board of the Colorado Permanente Medical Hospital. Uh, no, medical group for Kaiser Permanente. Um, he started his career in clinical and private practice in Denver, where he became the chief of plastic surgery uh, at Exemplar St. Joseph Hospital. And interestingly, he has spent um, the past 20 years during, in between his day job, he has volunteered his reconstructive surgery and consulting services to underserved populations in countries such as Nicaragua, the Philippines, Ecuador, Tanzania, and Nepal. Um, he's also past president of the Consortium for Community-Centered Comprehensive Child Care, a foundation that's built hospitals in East Africa. Um, Jack is also really just one of the leading spokespeople of our generation on issues, um, sort of thought leadership in confronting the many issues that face the healthcare system uh, in the US today. Um, and with that, I'm just going to turn the table over to him to let him tell you uh, what he has to say. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. It's not lost on me that it's a gorgeous afternoon out there and that we're competing with the weather and the elements in addition to uh, other things you can do to be uh, taking good care of your time today. So thank you. I'm going to start by asking you a few questions. Uh, first of all, um, we're going to talk about healthcare in the information age. And for those of you that are information experts, you will soon learn that healthcare sort of has its toe in the water of the information age. And we have a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn ourselves, and we have a lot to potentially learn from you around what that might look like in the future. So we're at a, we're at a very early stage of the information age. But I think at Kaiser Permanente, we, we have some thoughts and some experiences, some, some learnings, some victories, some, some losses that are probably useful and I'm going to share with you. So my first question to the group is, do you generally think that healthcare in this country has significant problems? Okay. I mean, that, that's a pretty high level of consensus. So. You either are patients, family members, or people who read the papers. <laughs> Do you believe that that situation is going to be primarily solved through the efforts of the insurance business and the insurance industry? We have a smart aleck in the back. <clears throat> How about it's going to be solved by hospitals? Okay, I'll take one long step forward for mankind. You think it'll be solved by physicians? <clears throat> well, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> Hostile crowd, go to page two. Do you think it'll be solved by the Accountable Care Act and Obamacare? At a minimum, it's a start. It's not a finished product. It's not where we hope to be forever, but it's, it's a start. So why are we here? Well, we're here because you have individual motivations for wanting to come listen to this topic, because you, you saw the topic, and that's mostly what you knew when you first looked at this afternoon. So you have your own individual motivations. I'd like to either augment your motivation or add one to you, which is to suggest that you were right in your answers to the first few questions. And that any of us, any of you and all of us, can actually contribute to making healthcare what it needs to be and where it needs to go into the information age in the future. You know, physicians and hospitals and the healthcare industry 
we're very comfortable with technology. We love technology. My career is in surgery, and that has gone from surgery that was done with large, long, open incisions to small punch holes, keyhole surgery, so-called, to robotics. And so we love technology. We've gone from x-rays to CAT scans to MRIs to PET scans. And so technology is not something that's, that's lost, foreign, or alien to us in healthcare. But information technology is a little more alien. And it's not something, you may be surprised, that uh, we have embraced universally or even enthusiastically in healthcare. Still lots of paper charts around the halls of medical offices and even some hospitals. And yet, we've had some great results. We've had some excellent results in healthcare for our patients and for our people. Some may remember when HIV was a fatal diagnosis. HIV was a diagnosis that carried a lot of futility and a lot of fear, didn't have a lot of good treatments. But in the time between 1995 and 2009, the death rate from HIV has gone down 82%. Really some excellent outcomes, significant improvements. It's gone from being a fatal diagnosis to a chronic condition. Excellent results. How about cancer? Cancer in men? This is not designed to be scientifically detailed, so I'm doing big brush, big picture here stuff. So overall, all comers, all causes of cancer in men, death rates have decreased. Between 1991 and 2008, 22%. And for female in the same period of time, 15.3%. So a series of significant improvements in healthcare delivery and really excellent results. Death rate from heart disease down 32.5% over that period of time. And so we, we sit on a platform where we're learning and we're, we're starting to get it in the management and treatment of some very difficult conditions. And it's a good thing because the demographics and the populations of our country and of the world are changing. So we're going to have to continue to be good at these things. We're going to have to be getting better. So we have excellent results, but I'm here to ask us this question. Is excellent good enough? Do we sit in a place right now where we can say, by golly, we've done a great job. We should congratulate ourselves. Obviously, it's a question that I'm going to spend some time on. So let's talk about who, we're, who is in the healthcare space that I didn't mention, not insurance companies, not hospitals, and not doctors. First of all, patients, OK? The role of patient is a totally involuntary state, right? Nobody dreams of, wants to be, or hopes to be a patient. I'd like to take a shot at that healthcare system. You know, I haven't had a good diagnosis for a while. So the role of patient is completely involuntary. It is often, as a matter of fact, very often, instantaneous. One goes from a moment where you really have nothing that you know of is wrong, and you have a heart attack. Somebody diagnoses a cancer or a degenerative disease, or a dementia, or you have an accident. Instantaneously, you go from where you were as a well person into the healthcare system as a patient. And the issues are also uneven as far as treatment, and access, and disparity. So the healthcare system, if you're a patient, is far from perfect for you. What about families? Well, the average family, this is, a, this is a, a 10 year from 1999 to 2009. Average monthly salary increase in this country, again, broad brush, big numbers, large uh, population, went up $1,900 per month over 10 years. What does the average family get for the $1,900? $870 was based, went up for non-health care inflation, general inflation in the community. You all remember when gas cost, you know, fill in your memory, fill in the blank. Higher taxes have gone up 125%. I, I did this before we did the latest California legislation, so that, that number has some upward mobility to it. And then $820 higher health care costs. Increase in premiums for the family, increase in co-payments, overall increases. Actual spending money over that period of time, $95 more per month over a 10 year period. That's what's going on with the average family. How do they adapt to that? Well, about a quarter of them 
decide to delay, defer, or just not have recommended care, recommended tests, etc. They simply say, we're going, to take, we're going to take this one a little bit of a risk. And a third of them choose other therapies, other alternative therapies for their care. They go to things that are not necessarily what we would consider in the traditional Western health system, our kind of Western medicine. They make that choice. So for these families, there is a net wealth transfer. For their employers, their employers have this dilemma. Do I take whatever profits I make from my business and apply it to salary increases or health care increases? And so at the family and the employer level, there's some wealth transfer and there's some trade-off. So for many families, not just health care, there's a lot of issues around the economy and jobs. The basic expectation, the basic fabric of the American dream has been tattered. It's not so good. It's not like it used to be. It's not like people had hoped for. Well, what about the economy? So I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail, but here's a, here's a snapshot over 57 years, 47 years, on education spending, defense spending, and health care spending. On education, we went from 6% to 7%. On defense, we went from 6% to 5%, and on healthcare, we went from 6% to 18%. Another example of societal wealth transfer, where healthcare is taking its share and taking share from other places. Tell that to the average public school teacher and that family. Tell them what's going on in their world. And so we, as people in the healthcare world who care about this, have to start thinking about how do we create an inflection point, because those dreams need to be restored. There needs to be opportunities for families beyond just paying more for health care. As a matter of fact, I would frame it this way. I think that those of us that are living inside of health care, we have an ethical, an ethical responsibility to keep health care affordable. When I started as a young surgeon quite a while ago, Health care was 10% of GDP. Today, health care is 18% of GDP. I guess you could call me an 18 percenter, right? And I've prospered. We're at 18% of GDP. I've had a professional career that has rewarded me. So I'm an 18 percenter, and what do I do about that? You know, Jonas Salk, the well-known polio researcher has a quote that I often state, reflect on, and remember. Our greatest, our greatest responsibility is to be good ancestors. So many of you that are quite young probably are not focused on your ancestry and your heritage. Some of us have given that a little twist or two in our heads as we've had children and now grandchildren. What is the legacy, what kind of an ancestor am I going to be? So this problem, we're going to start talking about solutions. We can't treat our way out of this 18% situation. We can't lobby our way out of it. We can't legislate our way out of it. We're going to have to learn our way out of this. Healthcare has to become a learning industry. Organizations like KP have to take a leadership role in that. And we also have to understand that it's not just about healthcare and healthcare entities. It's about all kinds of organizations who can imagine contributing to solutions in healthcare. So I'll tell you a story. I was at Genentech giving a talk a couple of years ago. No shortage of brilliant people in the audience. Some of the finest minds in the pharmaceutical research world working on great things. Good people, good souls, trying to find miracles and cures for difficult diseases. And they're thinking, how do we tr take good science, create efficacious products, something that's marketable, something that can be a business success, and that's all good. The issue is that takes care of the miraculous, excellent side of the wonder of healthcare. Can we also incorporate some thinking around keeping it affordable? What I said to the scientists at Genentech was, don't stop. We need your miracles, we need your ingenuity. We need your genius. But as you take that thinking and your learning and your research, maybe add a couple of filters, a couple of things to think about 
And that would be healthcare in the complex world is a lot of end-to-end -end care, connectivity, different interventions. And patients are very complex. Be thinking about how could you actually add something in there that was not just an ad of excellence and efficacy, but actually eliminated certain other things or made it actually less expensive to do. A 12-step solution turns into a six-step solution because of the miracles. And I don't have your answers. I've only got your questions. And I had people come up to me afterwards and they said, you know, we just simply never framed it that way. And I said, can you do it? And they said, we have no idea. But at least we have that framework as individuals, as, as scientists. We can start thinking about, it's not just about the miracles, it's not just about the next miracle, but it's understanding the complexity and the totality of the healthcare experience. That's why we're in the information school today. We're, we're trying to deputize a few people that aren't in healthcare to think with us in, in some of these areas about how things can get better and can get better faster. So talk a little bit about complexity. Uh, first of all, this is a graph that, that shows a distribution of cost of health care over a population. And what you see down here is that at the lower end, many people are very healthy. They go to the doctor never once a year. They don't contribute to the cost of health care at all. And then on the far side, people get progressively more sick, progressively more complex. And 50% of the health care dollar, of the national health care dollar, is spent on 5% of patients. And so that's a very significant difference. The top 1% of spenders account for over 20% of the spending of health care. In a society, or in what the insurance companies call an insurance pool, it all works out because some people get it when they need it, some people don't have to have quite so much, and it kind of evens out because of the way it's designed. But in addition to the um, complexity of the patients, we're also getting older. The baby boomers are hitting Medicare. We believe that health care is something that we want, deserve, and should have. We believe that death is negotiable. We believe we can live forever and we can have serially new parts that keep us going forever. We really have that belief that we're just getting started. Comorbidities. Comorbidities are when people have chronic heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, heart failure, depression, etc. And once you get chronically ill, they sort of pile up on some people. So at the age of 65, 50% of people have two comorbidities two conditions for which they're being treated. At age 75, 60% of people have, or at age 75, 50% of people have three comorbidities. So this is why we need integrated care and information systems. These are not buzzwords. This is how you manage complexity. I'll illustrate it. Why patients urgently need integrated care? Well, the average patient who has more than two conditions, or chronic conditions, during a year, we'll see up to 14 physicians. If those 14 physicians are well connected with good IT systems and good access to information at every place, seven by 24, it offers one solution. If they are seeing people that are not connected, some have paper charts, some have nothing, they are starting all over every time with their story. It's very, very tough to take care of complex patients. Those 14 doctors and patients, they get the, the, see 14 doctors, they, they create 37 visits. They go to the doctor almost every week. And they get 50 prescriptions. If the prescriptions come from f different physicians with paper prescriptions, who knows where they're all going? Who knows where they're all getting filled? We see pharmacies getting into the medical care business. We see organizations like us saying we have to have internal integrated systems so that we know we can do medication reconciliation. So that if you're on six medications, we know what they are, we know how they interact, and we know what the likelihood is that they're going to have problems. So the industrial age of medicine, which I'm going to leave behind today, is that doctor-centered, the physician in control with all of our knowledge and all the things that we've learned and relearned and, and, and continue to learn, and trying to control very difficult, very complex patients. It's, it's a daunting opportunity. So the information age of healthcare moves from the physician-centric world where the kindly old family doctor is the center of the universe. And in those days, 
There was only a few journals. There was only a few randomized controlled trials. And so if, if a physician had time to read every night, you could almost keep up with some of the medical literature. It's kind of like the 14th century with the monks and the tablets. If you really wanted to get the word, the good word, you had to go to the monks. And the monks had the tablets, and that's where the information was. And God did we love it, being monks. <laughs> because we were the center of things, and we had the knowledge, and we had the control. And then Gutenberg comes along, and he starts teaching people to publish. And then we have novelists and writers and people from all over that are writing. And we created some democratization of information. So the monk didn't go away. The doctor doesn't go away. The doctor now has to say, I'm a, I'm a different part of the future. I have to understand information. I have to work in teams. I have to use clinical pharmacists and nurses and social workers and support people because there's just too much complexity of the information and the knowledge. And so today, it's, it's a little bit like banks. Remember when you used to go to the bank to cash a check? Well, the bank had the knowledge, the power, and the product, and you went to the bank. And then the banks developed ATM machines, and the knowledge, the product, and the power moved away from the bank. And now you can deposit a check on your iPhone. All of those things have gone mobily and connectedly to the individual, to the customer. Banks have figured that out. She mentioned that I go to East Africa to work. About eight years ago, something happened in Arusha, in Tanzania. They put in ATM machines. I used to carry traveler's checks. Some of you, I'm sorry, I don't want to bring up your grandparents' habits, but it's traveler's checks. Or cash, you know, boots full of cash to go over. Put in my ATM card, what does it say? Jack Cochran. Would you like that in shillings, euros, or dollars? And yet, in that same country of Tanzania, if I got sick or I got injured, how do they know where my medical record is? So banks have figured it out. Bookstores have done the same thing. Remember, the, we love the dusty old bookstores with, with the, the cranky guy back in the stacks who had read 700 books and could give you a, a download on every book? Well, guess what? Amazon came along and says, we can give you a lot more information on books. We can give you 600 people that have read the same book and, and give you stratified data on the book. And we can sell it to you cheaper and we can have it to your house tomorrow. And then they went to Kindles. The product, the power, the transaction has gone from the parent's site all the way to the consumer. Healthcare, get ready. This is where we need to go. This is where we have to go. We have to go from an age where the old, we have to ask new questions. So if we have IT systems, I'm gonna talk about the information age next. We have the ability to ask new questions. The old question, Dr. Cochran, how many patients can you see? The new question, Dr. Cochran's team, how many patients problems can you solve? And some of them need email, some of them need visits, some of them need chat rooms, some of them need groups, some of them need, just need links to, to, to information, to access information. So how do we change that? I'm gonna talk about another new question. The old question was how do you get people to have their prevention done? Keep sending them postcards. You know, we've sent them 62 postcards for that colonoscopy and they just won't come in. Well, that's because they had a colonoscopy and they said, check, I've had a colonoscopy. That wasn't the highlight of my life. So, I'm going to assume I'm okay. The new question is, how do you create systems that optimize the likelihood and the chance that I'll get my colonoscopy because you've set up a system that favors me getting it? And we're going to show you how that's done using information and people. It's really exciting. And this is why we have our toe in the information world. We need people who can teach us more about swimming. And everybody is dabbling, looking at, and these are serious companies and serious products. You know, My Fitness Pal, the Fitbit, Archimedes, which is an organization which sort of has artificial intelligence around mathematical modeling for decision making. You put in your data, Archimedes tells you likelihoods that you're gonna have certain things. Watson, Watson, the famous IBM computer that won Jeopardy. You can't do that. You need a bright person to win Jeopardy. 
Well, let's think about things like skin lesions. You show a family doctor something called a seborrheic keratosis, and it has a classic look. And she may see one every two weeks. You take Watson and you show Watson two million of them, and you just keep showing the computer what that looks like. Pretty soon, they can look at a photo and say, I am 97% sure this is seborrheic keratosis. It may change the way the dermatologist spends their time. Maybe on that one you spend about a minute. Whereas on another one it says, I have no idea what this is, it's 50-50, it could be a melanoma. These are all the things that are happening around us. But are they happening with us? One of the things that we try to do in systems of care like Kaiser Permanente is to have that sort of scout horse mindset, looking for the miracles. They're everywhere. Some of them are great, some of them are not so great. Some of them help us, some of them we haven't learned how to use. But how do we employ and deploy some of these additional uh, additional tools. And this again goes to physicians have always liked technology. They just haven't embraced information technology. There was a, I'll wait on this, there was a, a survey came out about three weeks ago that said physicians who started to computerize three years ago, at that time 28% of them said they were happy with their computer or that they were unhappy with their computer. And now this year the same survey said 40% are unhappy. It slows them down. This, this says Old organization plus new technology gets you a costly old organization, okay? The miracles that you hear about five years ago was, whew, once we get computers in the doctor's offices, we're all right. Everything's going to be okay. Once we get those computers, everything's just going to miraculously happen. The problem is there's people involved, and some of those people are, are my chaps and my friends and my ladies and gentlemen of the medical profession, and some of them are patients. And so the, on day one, when you put in a new computer system into a clinician's office, two things happen. Number one, you add to their cost. You increase their cost of running an office. Number two, you slow them down. Those are the two day one impacts of putting a computer in the middle of a clinical office. Neither one of those sound like transforming healthcare in the information age, right? That's why all of the talk and all the hope that this is a, this is a technological solution has to be tempered with how do you also do change management and get people to want to change, like physicians. When we put in health, health IT, it doesn't come with an owner's manual, right? Here's the owner's manual. It says, this is how you transform healthcare. You know, on page 3C, that, in my car, that was where they had the oil, the type of oil. <clears throat> There's no owner's manual. We're, we're writing it. And I'm going to posit to you as we go along that we need people like you to help us write it. Because we have a profoundly in, ingrained physician and healthcare bias and point of view. We have to understand where we are not competent and where we can get better. So, I'm not going to dwell on this one, but once you get an electronic health record, you also get all kinds of stuff. And you get data. And data that you will find useful if you are in the check-in office in the emergency room, because you want somebody's address. And you want to, it doesn't have anything to do with what the doctor wants. So you have to take all that data, sift it, sort it, and prioritize it into information. These are the kinds of things that in a clinical setting we want to work, work through. And then you add those things together to start to create medical knowledge. It's a much smaller set of data. Medical knowledge says, I'm on three medications, I've had two surgeries, I've had this done, I've had that done. Now you're starting to use medical knowledge to work with me. And then you add data and information on treatments and therapies to create clinical utility. This is a slide I'm not going to dwell on. You probably understand it as well or better than I do. But it really speaks to the fact that we get lots of data. We have to turn it information. We have to learn how to use it. And I'm going to show you some examples where I'm actually very optimistic. Very optimistic. At a time when excellent is not good enough, I believe we can see a pathway. And I believe we're on that pathway. We're just not moving along that pathway fast enough. So the future involves not just bright doctors. We've got plenty of bright doctors. They're coming out all the time, just like the bright students at Berkeley. It's about information, it's about technology and tools, and it's about teams. And 
healthcare is a team sport. It's not the 14th century. This is a team sport that requires fantastic people working together, understanding about teaming and how they work to share. And right in the middle of the team is only one person, and that's the patient and their family. This is not the doctor in the center. This is the patient in the center. <clears throat> so here's an example. It's called the proactive office encounter. How does this work? This is the one that answers the question, how do you create systems that optimize the likelihood that you will get screening done, as opposed to how do you increase screening rates? So several data streams come to you. This isn't quite big data, but it's, it's, it's the journey toward big data. So you have different data sets. You have one data set that has a supply demand format for mammogram appointments. Every day we set up 65 mammogram appointments, and by golly, day in and day out, we have five or six vacancies. Every day. It's almost ironic how, how predictable it is. So, you can say, well, let's just build those in. Let's build in, out of the 60 appointments, every fifth or sixth appointment, we just leave it empty, we leave it open throughout the day. So we'll build in some of that, we'll try to anticipate it. It's not a perfect science, it doesn't work perfectly, but you start to say, Let's make supply demand match up with something else. The other data set is called a missed opportunity log, which is we have data and information. Remember, information, technology and tools and teams. Information says the mammogram re requirements comes from the American Cancer Society or, or the, the, you know, whatever the medical literature says, says you should have a mammogram every X months if you are X age. <clears throat> well, you are not getting that. Dr. Cochran, you're not getting your colonoscopy. And so we put you in the missed opportunity log, which means we've got you. We've got our eyes on you. And instead of sending you more postcards, we're going to say, we have some craftier things we can do with you. So we'll go back to mammogram in Southern California. Supply-demand matching, they had this ability to stratify vacancies in their mammograms. Missed opportunity log. Mary Gonzalez walks into a clinic to have her eyes checked. The ophthalmology receptionist, has the heart of a healer, but is not a clinician, and says, Mary, this prompt that came up on my screen says, you haven't had a mammogram for four years. I hate mammograms. I don't ever want to have another mammogram. Besides that, I don't have any problems. We can get you a mammogram in 45 minutes. Why don't you finish your eye appointment, go have a cup of coffee, and go have a mammogram. Doesn't mean she's going to, but the likelihood is very high that she's going to. Why do I use the name Mary Gonzalez? Mary Gonzalez went in, she had a breast cancer. Her breast cancer was early, it was treatable, and she was cured. She does our ads, you see her on the ads. She's cured because of an information system, of a team of caregivers, and the technology to support it. So a team that provides surveillance of that information. And it doesn't have to be doctor looks at every piece of data. You can allocate different roles for different people on the team. So the proactive office encounter, identify missing lab screenings, et cetera, provide members instructions, and contact the member and document them ahead of time. That's beforehand. Then when they come in, you identify and look at the alerts and prepare the patient for the exams and the pre-encounter follow-up. So surveillance before and preparation, connecting with them when they're in, and then follow-up. The after-visit summary and care instructions say, we couldn't get you in today for the colonoscopy, you still need to get it done. These are all people. They still don't necessarily comply. They still don't necessarily want screening. But I, I, I'll just give you some, some very interesting data. In Southern California, and that's just one region's data, they score above the 90th percentile now on HEDIS measures for breast cancer screening. They were best in the nation. Not for KP, but best in the country for a system of care that was evaluated for mammogram screening. Best in the nation. That translates mathem mathematically and psychologically and physically into saved lives. You get people in that were not going to get screened and they get, get diagnosed. 30% increase in colon cancer screening. 11% increase in breast cancer screening overall. 5% in cervical cancer and 13% over in cholesterol control. So, applying information at a fairly rudimentary level. You know, we, we have tools to stratify data and to, to rank people so that we know who to provide surveillance. There's still human oversight. We haven't gone all the way into a virtual solution. 
but it's very encouraging for clinicians to realize they're having this kind of impact on people. This data, when it comes back to doctors and nurses, they go, wow, I feel better. I feel like my career has been enhanced. I, I feel that for some, my career has been preserved. But having this sort, sort of information support to help people make better decisions and to provide care in a very complex world. Remember, these patients are very complex. So this is one example. I think it's so encouraging because when Southern California took their mammogram rates, when they first looked at them, they were going, wow, those aren't good enough. Two years later, they were number one in the nation. The next year, Kaiser Hawaii was number one in the nation. The guy in Southern California was less happy that Hawaii was number one. And I said to him, I said, actually, this is a better year for you because you're number three. And you've not only led the nation by being number one, you've led the nation by teaching other people to become number one. So you've touched people that you've never touched. And that's what I'm going to get to at the end here today about how we, we can change healthcare and in part restore those dreams to people who've really been left out. <clears throat> this is the cardiac care, collaborative cardiac care service. Say that three times. <clears throat> Why do I show this one? This one taught me about the information age of healthcare before we had computers, okay? 88% reduction in all cause mortality. The tools that we use, electronic medical record now, a disease registry, which is a list of patients with a particular diagnosis so we can monitor the list. Information development of protocols to improve outcomes, a rehab program, medication management, prompts and, and reports to support the protocols, and the team, physicians, nurses, and clinical pharmacists. Let me put you through this drill. Patient has a heart attack, pretty serious day, okay? Used to be a lot of mortality from heart attacks. Well, patients who've had heart attacks now have an 88% decrease based, based on historical comparison for mortality, okay? Here's what happens. Patient has a heart attack, <clears throat> and they are invited to go into a secondary rehabilitation protocol called the cardiac risk service. Nurses, pharmacists, and physicians team up with that patient to provide oversight of their cholesterol and their statins, oversight of their blood pressure and their medications, oversight of their exercise program, oversight of their smoking, connectivity, caring connectivity, not we're going to send you a pamphlet. Now that you've had a heart attack, take this pamphlet and get better. This is human connection, using information, and monitoring people. And so we have a team of people, and they are all supported by the registry, which is the list. Has everyone had their blood pressure checked this month? Has everyone had their cholesterol checked? And is it within the right range? So it's a team-based approach, using information. And all of a sudden, the patients don't, we don't have to have twice as many cardiologists. It's a primary care and team solution using information. And actually, cardiologists are better off not doing secondary rehab. They're better off doing high-intensity cardiology. And so this was, this was brought to me in 1997 by this wild-eyed internist who said, Jack, we have to have registries. And I said, John, what is that? <laughs> and he said, registries are lists of patients where we have all their data in one list. And he has a binder. He, I, he was the one who talked me into buying an IT system. He had a binder with all these patients in this three-ring binder. And he's showing me their cholesterol and all this. And he says, you can't believe our results. And he says, I presented at the American Heart Association. They didn't believe me. And then we published it in a peer-reviewed journal, Decreased Mortality. He was wild-eyed because he had seen a different future. And he wanted to computerize it. And I said, I think it's cool. You just got it in a binder and taught me as a surgeon. You know, I'm pretty fast, but that was pretty cool. And he just, and then you see the results and you know, how that translates into human suffering and human lives. So, very cool. And so what has happened in KP, over time, we've developed a culture. A culture that embraces measurement, comparison, acknowledgement, improvement, and learning. And I'll tell you a story of two internists. Two internists in the autumn of their career. That would be someone that looks a lot like me talking about one had gone at about age 50 from full-time private practice to a Kaiser practice. This was in Boulder, Colorado. And they were up at some medical meeting. They were listening to a talk on the medical home. And the guy from the community practice said, I've been a medical home for 25 years. I coordinate patients. I take care of them. I've been a medical home. And, you know, this is nothing new. And uh, the guy from KP says, you're right. You're, you're one of the best interests I've ever known. 
you've always taken great care of your patients. But he says, I got to tell you what happened to me when I went to KP. He says, I go in at the top of my career. I'm well known, I'm well respected, and I, but I really liked their system. I really believed in their system. I've been there about three months and my young chief, a young woman in her 30s, brings me my data. And I didn't ask for my data. So she sits down and she says, Charlie, I'm gonna sit down and show you your data. You know, you've got several care gaps here. And he goes, what do you mean? She says, you know, you're, you're missing some of these cholesterol screens, you're missing some of these blood pressure checks, you've got care gaps. And he goes, well, I'm a great doctor. She says, that's why we hired you, you're the greatest. But we're gonna give you this data and we're gonna provide you with nurses and pharmacists and clinical support and how to outreach to patients and to use a team-based approach and then we're gonna remeasure your care gaps in, th in three more months. And uh, he said, I was not very happy. <laughs> this young lady was in high school when I was still, you know, on top of my game. And he says, you know what happened? He's talking to this other internist. Come back three months later and my care gaps are almost all closed. And he says, you know what is amazing, Fred? It was just not on my radar screen. I was seeing patient after patient getting smiles back, getting a full waiting room, everyone was happy. And these people start throwing real data and real science into my face. And my first reaction was, you, sh you can't do that to me. But he says, you know what's really amazing now, Fred? I know you're one of the best internists I've ever worked with. But he says, you know what's even more important? I know and I have proof that I am. I've never been more gratified in my clinical career than to be supported by a data and a culture of measurement. So cool to hear that. A transformation of a professional who at one time was an idealist and through the bumpy waters of healthcare practice lost a little sheen on the ideals and became a little bit of a cynic and re rediscovered some of that idealism. So this is the future. This is the information age. This is, this is what's possible. So how does, how's Kaiser doing? You, you had to wait this long to get the advertisement, right? Here it is. <laughs> National Committee on Quality Assurance measures the most complex patients, the, the most complex conditions, chronic conditions, chronic conditions and their problems, and they measure them for hundreds of organizations in all states all across the country, and they rank them. These are from hundreds of organizations all across the country. Top 10, 2012, 2013. KP, KP, KP. What I'm showing you here is two things, three things. Number one, we're doing well taking care of the most complex patients and, and their illnesses. We got our problems, we got our challenges, we're working on them. The other data I'm going to show you is that every other one of those is an integrated model of healthcare delivery with IT systems and medical groups at working alongside with insurance. So, it's what the prototype looks like. The third thing I'm gonna tell you is that we weren't this good eight years ago. So when people say to me, well, you can do that, you're Kaiser. You can do it, you, you can do that, you're Kaiser. We can't do it, because we're not. Well, I will tell you, we couldn't do it as Kaiser until we did it. Until we took the step to automate, to take integration from a structural reality to a functional, program where physicians actually were leaders and actually work alongside teams as partners and really took on the issues in healthcare. So this is not a 70 year journey. We have, we've been on a rapid upslope to get to this good in the country. So it doesn't have to be repeated and reinvented for decades. What we do is replicable. So that's, that's our results. The future, a couple of things about the future. You know, we are trying to sort our way through as people who come from a scientific background and a technology love in, in healthcare and trying to deal with IT. And we get something new every day from mobility to big data to connectivity to patients sending us emails that are really quite searching and quite complex because they trust us. They send you tough emails not to make you squirm but because they trust you. And so, how we all learn together. This is where I'm saying we don't have the capacity to have all the answers. We don't have the people. We don't have the market cornered on smart people. I know you all think you do, but probably you don't either. There's at least another university around here that probably thinks they're close. Close. I did a surgery residency there, and by God, they think they're close. <laughs> 
So our future is to take what we're learning as Kaiser Permanente, and the only reason I'm going to show you this next slide is because it ain't always been this way, okay? We used to live happily in our silos. We lived in our silos. We lived in our castles. The moat was full and the drawbridges were up, and we managed everything from within. And we tried to get as smart as we could internally. And as the world got flatter, and as the world got more connected, and as the world got smarter, we couldn't keep that up. And so we have been on an intentional journey of trying to link to like-minded organizations in healthcare and outside of healthcare, because we're not going to treat our way out of this 18%. We're not going to lobby our way out. We're not going to legislate our way out. We need to learn our way out. And so our premise is that Kaiser Permanente, as a prototype, now, we are the center of the earth for this slide because I got to give the talk. We don't have to be the center of anything. We just have to be connected. We have to be part of this. And so we have organizations from all over the country that we work with, including UC Berkeley. And so these are group practices. Here's Dartmouth. Dartmouth is a very different healthcare entity. American Heart Association. We never used to be connected to these organizations, and we are now deepening and increasing our connections because we can say we're excellent, we can take these NCQA Medicare results and we can choose to celebrate. And I think that's fair enough, but not for very long. We have to move from celebrate to accelerate because the problems are still out there. It's still 18% of healthcare. Families are still trying to struggle. They need an inflection point. They need that hope restored. And so this is the model for the future, which is how do we work better with the iSchool? How do we work better with the public health school? How do we work better with the government? How do we work better with each other to say, this is a societal problem. We are the only country in the world that thinks healthcare is a privilege. We're the only country in the world that thinks it's controversial to cover its citizens. It is controversial to provide healthcare for your citizens. America. That's, that's what we think. If that's not what we think, it's sure what we do. So there's a thinking-doing gap there. And, and it's not good for anyone to have people outside of a system. It's like saying, we're only going to privatize education. And some of you people will just never get educated. As a society, as a just society, we've got to make healthcare work. It's got to become a learning industry. The reason I'm here is to try to deputize as many of you as I can to say, find a way, like those Genentech people, find a way that says, I think, I think this brilliant work I'm doing might have some linkages. I'm not asking you to change your lives and change your career unless you want to change the world, and then you're in. <laughs> so I think it's a great opportunity for us to expand our thinking and our connectivity around what the uh, options are. I am thrilled to be here to talk to you about this. I hope it was helpful, but um, let's get to work. We have time for some questions. I'm sure people have questions, so I will open the, uh, you, you need to take the mic. I have uh, 17 answers, so keep score. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was informative to me. It does, it does however, seem that you're just up against a tsunami. Uh, I mean, I've looked at the statistics, and if you cure every disease and prevent every uh, uh, cause of mortality right now, you extend survival by 12 years, and then everybody ends up in the geriatric ward. I just don't see how you're going to handle that. You've got a triage or something. All right. What was the, what was the question? <laughs> Maybe that was a question. I mean, you have an answer to that. Yes. What you're, you're just straight line extrapolation to get better and better medicine. Yes. And you're going to lead to a bigger and bigger catastrophe. Right, right. I'm, I'm reminded by a governor from Colorado, Richard Lamb, who uses the statistic that the lifetime health care expenditures for smokers is less than for non-smokers. That is not an end state for me as an 18 percenter. I have to do something different. Your point is superbly well, well stated. And we have to take a look at this. Healthcare is 20 percent of your well-being. It's 20 percent of your health. Impact on your health. Healthcare impacts your health by 20 percent. Your DNA, your environment, your built environment, your neighborhoods, your diet, your habits, all those things are, are there in many countries. So 
I don't apologize for the 18% fully because we, have, we spend so much less on social care than other countries. Again, we think health care is a privilege. Other countries will spend less on health care but a lot more on social care, and so they will find ways to support people in those environments. The adaptive behavior of people in need is amazing, and so there are a lot of things. We just saw this, this report from a, a guy named Jay Ogilvie who looked at futurists, looking at health care, and one of the trends which is interesting, which is senior communities just coming together, not to live in somebody else's assisted living, but coming together and building communities around needs in, in many places in the country. We see, um, uh, in our com company, we look upon this, this new reality, it's not a new reality, it's an old reality, but it's, maybe it's a renewed awareness, as taking more of a total health approach. So how do we not only provide that 20% and try to do it well and try to not just cut money, but to try to make it more and more effective and, and more impactful and hopefully you'll create some downstream savings, but to also work with schools and to work with communities and to understand. We, were, we heard about somebody from the iSchool from, was it Detroit, who looked at uh, the, the food deserts in Detroit uh, on a uh, distribution map and, and mapped it against green grocers because in the food deserts, the grocery stores, the places that sold groceries also sold whiskey. And so they, were, they didn't have fresh fruit in those communities and found ways to create some matches there. That's why we need big data. That's why we need an IT solution. So we have to take it on as a societal reality. There's a community in New Jersey that doesn't have enough money and has a lot of sick people and has a lot of problems. And they're taking a total health approach, which is how do we deal with the schools, the police, all the things that impact the community because we're not going to treat our way out of this. Now in healthcare, we can learn our way to a better place, but we also have to take on the totality of the issues. I believe we'll do it. I believe it's going to be uh, clunky because um, you know, we're, we're just starting to form sort of a learning network. Most of us, you know, Mayo Clinic used to be that where they were, the Cleveland Clinic where they were. We're now very well connected. We're very well connected with the Department of Defense and the VA, which are tremendously positive learnings in terms of health care delivery. And we used to sort of say, oh, the VA, gee, what's, what's with that? They get it. Good results, computerized care, good data, m significant improvement. So your premise is right. I can't give up. I, I got to keep trying to um, move people into this direction. But th the other thing that fuels me is that there's a lot of waste in health care. That 18% doesn't have to be 18%. If we look at overuse and underuse and misuse and medical error, there is there is some assets there that are not being spent properly. Okay. The uh, progress you stated. I can hear you. The progress you stated, the decrease in mortality. Um, that's correlated with increasing the rate of screening your patients. Um, the last slide portended the flow of genetic sequencing information that's coming your way. How is Kaiser positioning itself to deal with that? Yeah, we're, great, great question. So we're, it's, it's, I go back to the concept of a, of a learning industry and a learning organization. We have departments of research, we have departments of public health, we have departments of various things. We link to government agencies. We're trying to learn together and learn from a position of surveillance. So genomics, you know, at one point in time it's the answer, at another point in time we're disappointed. It's still growing, we'll st we're still learning. Customized genetically based medicine is not where we think it ideally can be. I don't know when it will get there, but I will tell you this, in terms of complexity of patients. So if I had, if I was on six medications uh, and I had heart failure and I had respiratory disease and I had a little problem with my kidneys and my liver wasn't so hot and I'm on those five medications. If you give those five medications and you put them into a test tube, they will have some reaction. If you put them in you, you'll have a different net reaction than if you put them in me because what is my percentage of cardiac output? What is my percentage of renal function? What is my percentage of liver function? And so trying to understand the, the combined complexity of different chemicals and what they do being put into people with different ages, different backgrounds, and different organ functions, it's mind-boggling. But once we have that database, we'll be able to personalize the therapeutics best suited for that individual. Correct. And, and when that happens, that, that is true. And 
you know, I, I believe that that direction is, is clear. Uh, I just don't have a time frame. And it could be kind of scary. You know, what if nobody died? That's the next movie. What if nobody died? <laughs> don't forget, I'm a plastic surgeon. I've got a hedge on that one. <laughs> Please. That, that was a great talk. Uh, talking about connectivities, uh, I think a lot of effort goes into connecting with other institutions and hospitals in the area. I think what do you need to do to connect the Bay Area schools and institutions like Kaiser and other healthcare institutions? Yeah. What do we need to do? Well, first of all, you, you'll notice that the, this slide's about two weeks old. Uh, and, and I said to people, wh where do we connect? There's two constellations here that we connect a lot with. Group practices, the American Medical Group Association over there, and the Alliance for Community Health Plans. We have deep relationships with these people where, where we meet with them, we teach with them, we learn with them. And so all of those organizations are, in effect, learning together. And, and, but they are kindred organizations. They are healthcare delivery systems. And so they are learning together. It's a fairly unofficial, you know, it's not an organization, healthcare learning league, you know, or something like that with t-shirts. It's, it's an unofficial sort of connected community where we try to learn together. What has changed, what has changed is there was a time you would go to a meeting, you would enjoy yourself, you would go to some great lectures, you would walk home, you'd have some good ideas. Today, I think when we go to meetings, we walk home with more of a network. All right, how did you do that, that, that care for people with chronic renal failure? Because I've never heard of that before. And then in a connected world, you can continue to learn with that person over time. So I think it's really taking advantage of information and connectivity to try to accelerate learning. Well, I told you that slide's two weeks old. <laughs> what, what I have told my team, Scott Young, who runs the Care Management Institute for Kaiser Permanente, what I've told my team is, I want us to figure that out with all these organizations, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the Department of Defense, AHRQ. We have very strong relationships with those organizations. That's why we're here at, at UC Berkeley. How do we find ways with Ano to say, you know, as you listen to us and as you hear our quandaries and our dilemmas and our problems, what sparks go off for you? So it's, it's a... It's a relationship building process. It's not just a, a magic, you know, you know, connectivity is great, but in things like healthcare, it's better if you have some trust to start with and then you stay connected. So some of our best operators inside KP, we have a guy in Southern California who manages 50 major operational issues. He's a, he's a brilliant guy, but he can't get an A on 50 courses at a time. So he hyper-focuses on six. What we need to make sure is that he knows Who's taking care of these 14? Who's doing these 10? Other places in KP or outside that he can stay connected with to leverage his own ability to focus. And that's where we haven't been. That's where we need to head. This is, this is not the 10th year of talking about this. This is the first year. Um, our medical malpractice in general is significantly better than the community. Uh, I think it's because we have good documentation, good records, and good outcomes. Uh, it hasn't eliminated it. You know, we still have the specter of uh, medical liability. It's another topic. You know, there's, some, there's two, two, uh, two stories about medical liability. Number one, it's not that big of a cost on the healthcare system. Don't get bent out of shape about it. It's not that big a deal. The other one is, uh, I'm trained as a professional in only one healing art. Anytime I'm sued, it destroys me, it destroys a part of me, and it changes the way I think, the way I work, and the way I act. And those are not scientifically reconcilable. W one is a, the data says it's not so bad, the other one says it's devastating. And so um, I, I err on the side of it's pretty devastating. So we, we have a lot of support systems for physicians and for patients, but we, we have not eliminated all all the issues in healthcare. Please. Hi, I, I view the American health system essentially as a group of uh, disconnected informational silos. Um, would you say Kaiser's is just another silo, um, albeit a bigger one, um, where I get a loyalty card and the, mo the moment I move beyond that silo, I have nothing. 
And uh, would you say that maybe an ATM kind of system is better where I move beyond the silo and I still have access? Yeah. Two things. First of all, we're a silo with tentacles, okay? <laughs> we're like an octus, octopus silo because we have multiple regions that are connected with each other. And so in 13 states around the country, you can get fully connected care. The other thing is we have, we have led some significant pilots on interconnectivity of data. We've done some big ones with the VA and with the Department of Defense in Southern California where patients with, with those common places are now fully interconnected. We're also doing it with five major systems, Mayo, Cleveland, Intermountain, Group Health uh, nationally to create interconnectivity on the IT front and we're going to expand that. So we get that, we understand that, it's not, it's not happening fast. It's also hard to, you know, plug a computer into a paper chart. So we've also got all that stuff in healthcare that has got to get up and running. Um, a, a lot of the uh, sort of projections that you have are based on the idea that early diagnosis and sc screening or preventive medicine, if you want to call it that, is a key to improving outcomes. Um, to, you know, obviously, there's a possibility that the most important part is screening out the patients who have symptoms but not illnesses. Probably 80% that you see uh, don't need your care, and you have to make that separation even before you focus on the t 2 out of 10 who have the disease. But my question is, all of this innovation with IT and connection and so on um, costs a hell of a lot. So you started out by showing that healthcare cost curve going out of sight. So where are we now, and how is this going to help? Good point. Well, f well first of all, you're right, in, and you've also done your homework. Uh, so for example, you will help hear, hear people say, prevention is good, it saves lives, and it saves money. And that's partially true. Not all prevention saves money. Sometimes it saves lives. Uh, but you, you have to realize that sometimes you do the right thing because it's the right thing. Not everything should be done ever to save money. But if you say in our healthcare system there is, there is enough opportunity for being more effective and more efficient in spending healthcare dollars, then we have ways to save money. And I think that we believe we have that. We believe we have it inside our system. And if, if you can just start to get that trajectory just under GDP growth, that's a big thing, and that's where we've been for the last two or three years. We have finally really taken that, and we've, we haven't done anything radical other than leveraging our learning and trying to become more disciplined and more effective around the care. Um, if you look at, uh, are you from New Zealand? Uh, South Africa, but I have practice in New Zealand. Okay. You know, if you look at the number of MRIs that are done in South Africa versus the United States, they're, they're not comparable. And so we are a society that says the only good care is lots of care and lots of s surety and intervention and certainty. And that's just one philosophy. I think we should deliver superb care, but I think we all should also understand that not every twinge needs a whole bunch of radiology and not every, and not every uh, symptom needs a whole lot of medication. Uh, it, it's, it's doable. But the patient has to be part of the solution. You know, if you still go into a physician and you say, I insist on getting an MRI on my knee because I twisted it, you'll get an MRI on your knee most of the time, no matter who the physician is. You know, our job is to serve. We, we can try to say, you know, actually there's no indication for it, but then some people will say, ah, I know what you're up to. You're trying to save money on the back of my well-being. As a society, we've got to get more mature about those conversations. But, but if we give up, the ship is going to look really bad. <laughs> Please. Hi. I work on California's Medicaid waiver, and my question is regarding the role of state, federal, and local government in this web here. I think it has a great role. I think it has a great role. I mean, I think that we have to, uh, as I say, this is, this is, this is not a 10-year series of thoughts and evolutions. This is a, a theory, and we've got two constructs where we work with people a lot. Those are the ones that are vetted up there. The others are just people we have loose connections with. But I think those are the things that we, we need to explore and we need to do differently. I mean, a Medicare patient's diabetes is not different than a uh, Blue Cross patient's diabetes. And, and th that's, a, that's an artifact of our system a little bit. Any other questions? Yeah. 
question over here. I, uh, so there was a time when I was well, a Am I at 17? You're, you're close. Because I'm running out of answers. I'm really, I'm, <laughs> I'm dying up here. There was a time when, when I was a, a Kaiser patient. Uh, but um, the big data seems to me that it works reasonably well when you have a large sample size, which you do for the more common diseases. And I was wondering what experience you have had uh, around because you have so many patients in, in all these states, what experience you've had around uh, uncommon and rare disease and the ability to uh, make some advances in, in some of those? Well, I, th I think, I believe that yes, they are rare uh, in a community of you know, 20,000 people. In a healthcare population of 9 million, they are less rare. So, so our scale does create data opportunities for us to be a little more clear about what the natural history of certain diseases are and, and interventions. So we are often sought out by or organizations to say, boy, your data would really be useful for us to look at uh, scleroderma or something like that. So it, we do have the advantage of scale. And if we are more linked as we are in many things, you know, we work with the American Heart Association and we work with the American College of Cardiology on heart disease. We, we have a lot of data sharing and a lot of, a lot of data that we share with people. But the interesting thing about some of the uncommon diseases is while medicine was trying to figure it out, patients already formed their own communities and they, they, you know, they formed their own national networks. It's an, issue, it's an interesting issue that we deal with about the concern that patients have around privacy. And so if I have Cochrane syndrome and I don't want anybody to know it, so if it's in my Kaiser chart that I have Cochrane syndrome, you can't tell anybody or I, you're going to be in big trouble. And then I go on Facebook, and I want to find a Cochrane syndrome community of people who can help me deal with Cochrane syndrome. It's like, now wait a minute. Are you pro-privacy or not? And the answer is yes. It's my privacy. You can't mess with it. I will be as private as I want to be. You have to be completely private with me. So that's called patient centricity and patient's rights. It's like people debate whether patients could, should see their own data. Let's, let's review the language there see my own data. Yeah, I think I should. Sixteen, going once. Ah, the money ball. No, this is, I mean, this is really fascinating. And I mean, in some ways, you're sort of, by the end, you're talking about sort of how society is going to have to reorganize to deal. I mean, your network is reaching out to many, many different I just didn't have community. enough time. Yeah, I, right. I was headed there. Well, you mentioned, you know, it, because it's true, the communities, the schools, everything is implicated. And I was just looking at your network chart and thinking, oh my God, it's exhausting having to be, keep all those connections. So I'm wondering if you thought, and maybe this is, this is just this week, so you, have, you, you, know, you can just pass on this entirely. But as, if you think about network structures, there probably needs to be some level above just a flat chart with lots of nodes that are connected to sort of, as there are lessons that get, they need to get distilled and somehow accumulated yeah. in some, this is, have you thought about that kind of issue? I thought all? I'd come over here and find out if you have a brilliant graduate student <laughs> who's in trouble, <laughs> needs an assignment. There you go, they need to, a To reboot topic. their uh, behaviors. Okie dokie, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. I, I, I don't know the yeah. answer to yeah. that. I come with questions and limited answers. Well, we will try to work on answers. But thank you again so much. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you.